There's that phrase. Let's see, so we let's see, I can't, I can't sing super slow. Um, Looks like people did really well on the last homework, but I got a lot of people that didn't do it at all. You go ahead. Oh yeah. So yeah, I was just was looking at Pearson, uh, average score of a 93. That's pretty awesome. I got to say, that, that sounds great. The only thing troubling me again is that, I mean, I've got 34 out of 53 people total who completed it. So there's a lot of zeros. Fortunately, those zeros are going to really hurt people at the end of this course. So I'm not sure if Zoom. I have, I've got myself here. Okay, interesting. Oh, let me see. Was that right? All results. Let me look. Uh, homework four. Why is that? So homework five. Yeah, homework five was due yesterday. Let's take a look. Yeah, I think homework five was yesterday. Yeah, this was on banking and, and other things. How do banks create money? You all know how the banks create money now, right? They do it by lending. It's that all iterative process, reserve requirement ratio, one of the multiplier, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so everyone seemed to do pretty well. So I'm not going to review that stuff right now. Um, I found a video on one thing. What, what I wanted to talk about was um, just real quick. This is for microeconomics. Sorry. I'll go to the Fed. And actually, I'm going to zoom. I'll share my screen. Coming in, that uh, you'll need to get the QR code from me at the end of the class. Let me share screens here. Sorry, my internet's really slow today. Uh, so, you all remember that uh, interest rates historically, I mean, you should have an idea about the shape of interest rates over the last century and also what they're doing now. So interest rates peaked around when? The, the highest, remember it, interest rates as a general shape, it looks like a big mountaintop almost, right? And when, did, when was that peak happening? My internet's incredibly slow, so I'm just, I don't know if I'm going to even get to look at this thing. Uh, but you remember when? Um, historically, there we go. We'll, we'll just pick mortgage. We'll look, yeah, so the peak was actually, uh, well, the actual peak was 1981, you see? And you should also, so you should know that the interest rates were peaking in the early 1980s. You should also know that coming up into that period, what was going on, that's the period known as the 
the great, the great inflation, right? The great inflation's going on, right? You got oil crises happening then, you got inflation, and why did they start raising interest rates? It was to combat that inflation, you see? So the Fed before that was, was really pursuing a goal of having low unemployment targets without considering, and there was this thought that they could just kind of keep pursuing this indefinitely and that, uh, and that this would work out and it ended up not working out. And so, and so then the government turned their stance and said, okay, we got an inflation problem. We're going to combat this and we have to credibly combat this by raising our interest rates, right? And raising interest rates in the ASAD model, if you all remember, just to cast that off. So if you have a, um, I get supply, I get demand. And in that case, we were actually running the economy rather hot. So this is our L LRAS. L R S our actual GDP was giving run above potential because the government was pursuing was pursuing uh, low uh, low employment. They're just trying to eradicate unemployment, right? And so, if, and so, if, if you're above your potential, do you remember all how this corrects real quick? We'll just do this real fast. Remember how how would this What's going to bring us back to our long run equilibrium in this model? Remember, prices and those. So in this case, uh, wages become the labor market is tight. Employers can't find workers, so that they have to raise prices. I see this going on here today. Even we see that they have to you know, try to attract people. So, so wages have to rise. That 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 moves what? It moves which curve? Wages rise. You got to get this just flowing out of you. Come on. Come on. I know we're all tired. I've been up since, I don't want to one up y'all, but I've been up since 3 a.m. trying to get caught up from my computer crash last week. God help me. I, I am. Huh? Yeah. So, so, so they're pursuing low. So before in the 70s, they're pursuing low employment as a policy target, right? So they're, they're expanding the money supply, they're, they're pumping it up, they're trying to stoke it up and they're pushing the, the re actual GDP above its potential. And what I'm saying is that in that kind of an economy, how does, how does this get back to its equilibrium? Remember the rubber band? The rubber band wants to look like that. Well, it doesn't, it's, it's not controlling the minimum wage. What happens is that you can't find workers. So you know, so you can't find workers, so you necessarily have to raise your wage in order to get the people, right? Yeah, and then, and so what is that, what is that, how do we get back? How, what, what adjusts here? AS. AS, right? Wages cost the business, AS curve, it's going to shift, costs go up, right? And then at the same time, at the same time, they're trying to continue to push the policy. So at the same time, they're, they, they keep bumping us out here, right? And then and AS just keeps, and you see pricing just taking off. Inflation is taking off. Okay. That's what was going on there. So to combat this, they raise interest rates, interest rates go up, driving what? What's the channel? Tell me the whole story, let's go quick. Investment, drop, try to pull that aggregate demand down, bring the prices down, bring the prices down, right? So you see rising interest rates combating inflation causes that causes okay a major crisis in itself now this is this relates to banking and all this sort of stuff that's why i'm leading into it you have to understand the background of what's going on there so to understand what kind of crisis anybody know what, what, what crisis was caused at this peak anybody 
you got a major crisis in the U.S. that caused a reform in banking, and it was called the savings and loan crisis. Have anybody ever heard savings and loan crisis? Okay, you need to know this. This is testable. This will be savings and loan SNL crisis. What happens, and in order to understand the crisis, you need to understand, now you know banking, right? So back then, if you wanted to get a home loan, you would go into a bank, the bank would give you the loan, and then you would pay the bank back the money, right? So this is what's going on. This is what's going on, folks. Look at the banking side. How's the bank make money? It makes money on the interest rates it gets from loans. What are the bank's expenses? Well, besides all the you know, running the bank kind of stuff, the bank also has to pay interest to the people who deposit their money there, right? Now, now the interest rate's so low, it's like almost nothing. But back then with 15% interest rates, that's a good chunk of change. You, get, you can't get that in the stock market right now. Stock market's probably gonna be flat for a while, just so you know, folks, my, my prediction. Um, we'll talk about that hopefully by the end of the class. But, but so, the, so the bank's paying money on deposits in the form of interest rates. And so in order to understand the SNL crisis, we need to have all this background with the understanding of, uh, of also the, 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 the trend in interest rates. And now we can put all the pieces together. It's probably a puzzle right now. I hope you all followed the background because it's necessary to understand what happens here. What happens is how long are loans? Loans are what, 30 years? 30 year home mortgage, right? So, so let's look at the revenue side of the bank. The revenue being the interest they'll collect on loans. Say they're locking in on a 30 year mortgage and rates are at 10%, okay? That means that their revenue side becomes kind of fixed for 30 years at 10%. They're going to get 10%. So they took money in, just like we did in the banking. They lent it out like they should. And they're going to get 10% on that money that they lent out. Now, at the same time, interest rates are starting to take off. Okay? So that means their revenue is locked in at 10%. What about what's on their expense side? Their expense side, again, is the interest that they have to pay depositors that keep the money at the bank. You see? Do you start to see the problem here? What is the problem? Someone, someone crystallize it for me. I'm gonna make sure y'all, I, I, I kind of said it, but. Yeah, so, so in order to, so, so you want to deposit the, your money at the bank, I have to start paying you higher interest than what I'm collecting on my loans. If I do that, I start losing money, which I can do for a little while. Eventually though, I'm gonna run out of cash and become insolvent as a bank, right? What's the other option that I could choose? Just don't raise your interest rates, right? But then what's gonna happen? Because interest rates are rising, people are gonna take the money out and put it somewhere else. So effectively, you almost get a run on your bank, right? As people start to take out a bunch of funds. They start taking out the funds and putting it somewhere else. Then all of a sudden, you're, you're not meeting your minimum reserve requirements and you're in trouble right there. If you don't meet your minimum reserve requirements, and this is going to get into monetary policy a little bit, which is what we're going to start to talk about today. The Federal Reserve can loan you money that they're a lender of last resort. So, so they can loan you money at an interest rate, but you're paying interest on that, okay? So no matter how you cut it, these rising interest rates create, created a massive, massive problem for the bank's financial situations. And, it was the, and you should understand it as the different, there's a, there's a maturity differential between their, on their revenue side and on their income side. Making sense? On their income side, there's the, the rate is variable. It's whatever it is today. 
on the income side, it's fixed. Okay. Leading to a massive foreclosure across the country of all kinds of different banks. And we had a gigantic banking crisis that emerges out of all this. Okay. So, um, a ton of things. I won't go into all the details. There might be a reading. I, I, might, I think there is a reading I'll, I'll put up um, with some questions and things for exams and things. But you should get the, the big picture hopefully now, okay? And so that's the big picture. And then what you should really get is also what was done as a result. The policies and the changes in banking that happened as a result was the creation of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Okay, which might mean not a lot to everybody. But basically you had, um, you had a government program and, 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 they, and, they, and they started to go through a process of actually securitizing mortgages. Securitize, and what does securitizing mean? What is that? Securitize? Folks, let's run. I'm exhausted. I know you guys are tired. I need some energy, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm about to fall on my feet. I'm so tired. I need, I need to draw from you guys a little bit, okay? Or else you're going to see this guy just <laughs> up here. What's a security? Securitization. Yeah, it sounds that way, right? Security, securitization. Uh, in in finance. In financial terms, a security is a piece of paper, right? A security, it's a, it's a piece of paper that, 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 that can be traded on stock exchanges. A stock is a security, okay? But, but so I, I, I can basically create, you can think about it like it's not stock, but it's a security that represents mortgages. How do you do that? Well, a mortgage, what is it? Think about it. It's a IOU, it's, it's a stream of cash flows that goes into the future, you know, like people will be paying it back. And so as a bank, you're making all these different loans and then you bundle them, There's a, there'd be an investment bank that could bundle these different loans into a big pool of loans that the big pool actually sort of represents a series of monthly payments going forward, you see? And then I'll write a security, a piece of paper that then can be traded on exchanges that gives you the rights to those streams of incomes in the future, almost like a bond, you see? Except the bond is backed by a mortgage. That's why it's a mortgage-backed security. That's what a mortgage-backed security is. And so think about how does this solve the problem? This solves the problem that you had of the SNL crisis because banks no longer hold your loans anymore. Now, in order to securitize something, there had to be mass standardization in lending and lending practices, which is part of, of what Fred, Fred, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all these people, that they're, they're, they're involved in this process of standardizing, securitizing all these types of mortgages and giving it the framework to do this. Uh, but you have to have everybody kind of going through similar, you know, credit, there's, there's certain, actually, if you go, go get a mortgage, it's incredibly like checking all the boxes of everything and everybody checks the same boxes. So you get standardization, securitization, and banks don't hold that debt anymore. Actually, investors do. Interesting thing is, uh, I don't know if we'll get into derivatives and swaps, all that kind of stuff that led up to the 2008 crisis, but the securitization actually, oh, there's, there's a whole story about that. Um, but you basically, the, the thing that you really need to know is just the secure, that this led to the securitization of mortgages and that's how the world runs today. You know, the bank's not holding your loan anymore. Okay. Um, This will become kind of relevant in uh, 
in terms of future policy. But so interest rates were, were got really high and then became sort of this era of classical monetary policy. What is monetary policy? Well, to understand monetary policy, I need to introduce you to one other abstract model that's it's really a simple model. So here, here's, here's a new model that, again, everybody needs to know. It's really straightforward, though. It's the money market model. On the top, you have an interest rate, and this will be the quantity of money. Okay. So it'll be a, a typical economics, you know, supply, demand. So let's run through this. Demand, obviously, I mean, you should guess that's going to be uh, this is money demand, downward sloping. Why does that make sense? Well, think about the interest rates as the opportunity cost of holding cash. In other words, if I give you cash, you could put it in under your mattress and keep it as money. But if you do that, you're not going to make any interest. You see, that makes sense. Interest rates are like an opportunity of holding cash. So at higher interest rates, there's a higher cost of holding cash and therefore money, the money, actual money demand is lower. When interest rates are lower, the opportunity cost of holding cash is lower. Therefore money demand is higher. Okay. Now the money supply is just the money supply. It's not going to be influenced directly by interest rate, it just is what it is. The, the government's gonna have so much money out there and they're gonna supply it. So, so as far as quantities, the money supply is just this vertical line. This is our money supply. And what this model gives you is the market interest rate for a given money supply. And now hopefully you see a real link, which is if the government prints more money, how does this affect? So this is the, this is the monetary uh, economy right here. How's this gonna affect our, our real economy? I had it kind of right there. Now let's just run through a couple quick. So now in terms of the real economy, I talk, I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about the real economy where we use our, our ASAP model. And say we are have this situation. Okay, if we have this situation in the real economy, like that, let's see. We have this situation up here in the real economy. What kind of money supply policy? What should the what should the government maybe be doing in terms of money supply? Can you think through it, folks? What's that? What needs to go left? So 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 how do these two things link? How does my money market model and my ASAP model link? What's the link? Yeah, but what so so but what actually links this model to this one? Can you see? I'll circle it. You see? Interest rates. In other words, we can change the money supply to manipulate interest rates in order to make changes in, in the real economy. That's the, that's the kicker right there. Hopefully you all got that. It's the basis for monetary policy. So if I'm in a real economic situation here, how would I want interest rates to go? If, if so, first off, am I in a recession or a hot economy? What, what, what part of the business cycle am I in here? Yeah, 
Well, so to, to evaluate that, I need to look at my, my Y, my actual GDP, and look at my potential. So in, in terms of business cycle, am I, am I in an expansionary period or a recessionary period? Well, expansion, so, so remember, uh, just to show you again, uh, we've got time. And remember there's, uh, there's GDP and we see the GDP kind of is moving like this. There's something I'm just drawing up with that graph. And then you have a potential, remember? There's periods where here's your potential, and here's my actual. Yeah, when, when you're when you're below your potential, you're in, you're in, you have a what's called a recessionary gap, right? Is that right? So if the government is going to intervene in this case. It wants to, it has the goal to eliminate that recessionary gap by incre increasing actual GDP so that it's equal to potential. Some of y'all aren't looking up. I, I don't understand. Some people are gonna be super lost if you're not following all this. Is anybody just totally lost right now? Come on, pipe up. Like, like let's, let's, get, let's get it all on the same page. Anybody totally lost? If, if you are, then speak up. So, cause, cause I don't want to just keep going on and then, and then losing you more and more and more, you know, anybody super lost? Come on. You got it. You guys are being shy. Is that it? Going to be shy. We've known each other for a while now. You're going to be shy with me. Come on. Okay. So you see here, Actual GDP is less than potential. There's a recessionary gap. So this would be a case where actual is less than potential. You have this sloop in the business cycle. And if the government's going to address this with monetary policy, and they're going to do that by, by manipulating interest rates, my question is, how would they manipulate interest rates? Would they want interest rates to go up or down? Who's going to be the rock star here? Well, so if interest rates go up, how would this model get affected? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm telling you that the model's linked by the interest rate. And, I'm, and, and so first off, before we get to how we might think about monetary policy, I just want us to think about how we would like the rate to go. So, so in this case, would rates going up or down help or hurt this gap? So if rates go up, then how does then what's going to happen here? As rates go up, then investment goes. No. Yes. It is flipped. So as interest rates go up, investment pushes investment down, yeah, right? Because lending becomes more costly. So you can't do those kind of investment projects, real investment, capital projects, right? They're right. So if interest rates go up, investment goes down, aggregate demand would increase, would fall, increasing the recessionary gap. So opposite we want, right? Interest rates fall, we want interest rates fall to pump up investment push this out. And I focus specifically, just so we know, aggregate demand is consumption, investment, government, and net exports. I focus a lot on this investment channel, but there's also other channels and in, in the interest rates will work at with, in terms of consumption and also in net exports. Um, we'll have to get to the end of the whole class before we can really appreciate this channel. Um, and, and there are channels here. So as interest rates fall, it also makes it cheaper to get a credit card. You can go out there and spend some more stuff, right? 
you can you can think about it this way too. Um, I focus a lot on this investment channel because when we looked at the data, investment was what was leading a lot of these recessions. So it's it's the big story. Okay, um, there's a lot of stories there. There's a lot of channels that this could be running through. So the key thing you see here that we want to have, so we want to have interest rates fall, investment to go up, that, to eliminate that gap. That's what, so how do we get it here? Our money supply should go, how do we get interest rates to fall here? Hmm? Money supply, we want money supply to shift out, don't we? Money supply, so if we increase the money supply, that puts this downward pressure on interest rates. And so, yeah, so increasing the money supply, putting downward pressure on interest rates, driving up investment. You can also think driving up consumption and export and through this exporting channel. Okay, those those all are other channels. They're all moving in the same direction, though. Lower interest rates, higher consumption, higher investment, higher net exports. I focus on just the investment channel. Okay. But hopefully by now, and this is and this is what you'll be faced with is you, you'll be faced with, you know, maybe given a situation in a in a ASAD sort of setting and ask what kind of monetary policy would you implement? Um, so increasing the money supply now, now a question becomes like, okay, well, how, how could they, how could they increase the money supply? Um, traditionally going back, so going back to, you know, this old historic time period. Now, this is another thing you should know in data in the data trends of things, what were the excess reserves like in that time period? Folks? There wasn't a lot of excess reserves, right? Remember when we looked at excess reserves, it was almost like right at zero, it looked like all the way up until 2008 and then they start piling up. That's why all those data trends, you gotta just store in your brain. So what does that mean? That means banks were actually going out there and lending the money that they had. They're trying to get it out of their vaults. They're trying to put it into work so that they could earn the revenue from it. That's what was going on. Okay. So one of the tools that they had back then was that, remember what, what, what was constricting their, their lending activity? It was the reserve requirements. They're required to keep a certain fraction of, the, of, of the, what's in the bank in reserve. Remember the reserve requirements. Reserve requirement, right? So, and, and as you remember, what was the multiplier? So the lending activity creates a multiplier effect and that multiplier is equal to what? If this is RR, it's equal to this reserve requirement ratio. What was the multiplier? The deposit multiplier is one over RR. Right. So one over RR is our, is our deposit multiplier. So look at this, the smaller the reserve requirement, the larger or smaller the multiplier. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the larger the reserve ratio, the smaller the multiplier, the smaller the reserve ratio requirements, the larger the multiplier, you see? If they shrink the reserve requirements that banks have to keep, they can, they can in effect, because banks are actively going out there lending and they're trying to, and they're, and they're chasing profits and they wanna make money, shoot, they wanna, they wanna put their money to work. So if you, if you decrease the requirements that they have to keep in their vault, they'll go through that lending. And by doing that, the process money supply can shift out, okay? What do you think of that as a policy today? 
maybe not as effective. Why? Because banks aren't lending out all, all of their reserves, right? You got this big pileup of excess cash. Of course, some are, some are out there doing that. But you have a big pileup of excess reserves out there. When we look at excess reserves, it's in the trillions and trillions of dollars. I forget exactly where it's at. It's, it's at a huge amount right now. I don't know exactly all like what what the profile of all banks across the U.S. looks like, but as far as like who's is stocking up excess reserves and who's like right there at their requirements, but there's just a lot of excess reserves there now. So that gives you a hint that maybe this policy vehicle is a little less effective. What else makes this policy vehicle not effective today? So if the government wants to increase the government wants to increase actual GDP, they would, they would pursue what's called expansionary monetary policy. They would expand the money supply. If they want to bring GDP back in the rain, so, so real GDP is about here, you're in a hot economy, they want to re rein it in, they should contract the monetary base, do contractionary monetary policy. See? So in terms of expansionary policy, if, we're, if we have a recessionary gap and they want to expand policies using money supply, how does this model kind of fail right now, fail to work? Anybody? I've given you a lot of different macroeconomic patterns of things. So now it's just kind of a matter of like figuring out which ones you need to put together. What about interest rates? What, what are interest rates at pretty much right now? In real terms, real interest rates are, huh? No, they're actually negative. Because what is real interest rate? Nominal minus inflation. I mean, in like right now, talk about today, today, right now, real interest rates are, are negative or zero, like zero negative, right? So that means that pushing the money supply out here, is that gonna drop interest rates further? Where can they go? You see? So what you end up with, if you want to model this, how you would do it is that money demand curve is not downward sloping. Now you can draw money demand curve as downward sloping in this region and then flat. Rates can't, rates can't drop lower with increased money supply. You see? You get a flat money demand curve at why? Because what's the opportunity cost of holding cash when interest rates are zero? There's no opportunity cost, right? So you get a flat money demand curve. This is money demand for the flat section. And, and maybe the interest rate here is, maybe this right here is uh, where the rate is zero. It's not gonna go below that. This is called a liquidity trap, by the way. But you see that our that our that our monetary policy breaks down as a vehicle. The traditional model of things breaks down, but it worked well through from the from the '80s all the way up to the present. Why? Because there's a lot of room for the interest rate to drop. And the interest rates were pretty high. 17% is, is high. And of course, this did actually spur on a lot of different waves of new investment as the interest rates dropped from that high level. I mean, just to put it in perspective, my mother's house, I think when I said this, it's a third the, third the real price of my house. Okay? In terms of dollars. And... We had, the, and when she got her mortgage, she paid the exact same amount that I'm paying on my mortgage today. And she could buy three times as much of a house in terms of dollars. See? 
So that just shows you as interest rates are dropping, that does actually make it much more feasible to do investments and make take loans and go through these kind of things. There are a lot of different types of investments that were created by, by dropping it. But now I guess what the game's over folks, well, already at like a zero bound. And the last hurrah about dropping interest rates was really right before 2008. When I look at interest rates, you know, they, uh, they got dropped. So, so you should know that the modern history that 2001.com bust. We dropped interest rates to fight that recession, spurred on a housing bubble. Okay, there's an explosion. So, so here to put it all in context, there was an explosion in housing. Banks. Now, now you, now you, now you got a whole picture. I'm, I'm putting a story together for you, folks. This is, you. If you hear me, you're going to really understand this U.S. economy a lot more. Okay. So 2001.com bust, interest rates dropped, for, like we're getting close to the end, they're dropping down low to historic lows, explosion in housing, banks don't hold the loan, they're issuing out paper, that means they're not taking the risk if this thing, if, if all of a sudden I shouldn't, I shouldn't start paying, right? All of a sudden I say, hey, I can't pay my mortgage, does the bank care? The bank doesn't give it. Bank doesn't give a damn because they're not holding the loan. It's in the hand of investors. They're the ones holding the cash flow. You see. So do you think banks might have been having an incentive, maybe, to be a little bit more risky in the loans that they were giving out because they're not actually having to pay the price of a default. They only get the revenues if they get the sale. So you got a bunch of people out there just pushing, loan people just pushing to give anybody a loan. I mean, hell, I was a I was a student who had no work history. I I was you know bad with my credit when I was in in which you shouldn't do by the way. But long story short, I never checked my mail, and you know I had a couple things, and yeah, I got stuff paid, but it was like you know, nothing major, but still I shouldn't be getting a home loan with no work history and dings on my credit. But sure enough, they're happy as heck to give me loans. And this was going on on a massive scale. There, there was actually what you saw was the subprime, subprime <clears throat> mortgages that had a very high risk profile. There's a lot of riskiness in lending. And then what happens? Interest rates can only drive the housing bubble so far. Eventually, housing prices start to peak and decline. And you have a bunch of people that were risky, risky, should never have got a mortgage anyway. Very risky people to have to be on the hook. And all of a sudden now they're upside down, meaning that, that the housing prices are dropping and they're owing more than they're actually. So in other words, the, the loan that they have to pay back is higher than the dollar value amount of their home if they sell it, meaning that they sell it. And actually there's a chunk of change that's still left unaccounted for that they have to pay. Leading to massive, leading for people to default, causing a whole shockwave of, of secondary effects because as people default, houses go up for auction, they get sold cheap driving the housing prices down further. It's called fire sales of so asset fire sales. Okay. Y'all getting the picture here? What was going on? So they had a problem and then looking at interest rates, let's just take a look. Let's look back at interest rates. Let's look at um, interest rates during this last crisis. There's different types of interest rates. You'll need to know what the effective funds rate is. You will need to know that. It's basically just the rate that banks lend to each other at. Okay. This is the rate that banks are lending. There's all kinds of interest rates, effective funds, effective funds rate. Go read about it. Okay. 
That's on the test. You'll, I'll just give you that homework to read about what it is. Um, it's an interest rate, but look, but look what was going on. Interest rates, 2008, you know, they're, they're, so 2008 is happening right here. Interest rates fall down for the last time. Well, until they started climbing back up and fall, and then fell back down in the last recession. But in 2008, interest rates drop, and yet here's uh, February of 2009. The crisis was still critical at that point. You see, you're still in a recession. What does that mean? That means GDP is still shrinking. You're still shrinking, right? Well, now what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're here now. You're here now. So what are you going to do? Game over, folks. Right? Wrong. Actually, they, they came up with another idea. Anybody know what idea they came up with? 2008 recessions. We kicked it off. Anybody know? A new type of policy. Oh, anybody heard of quantitative easing? The quantitative easing, also known as QE, rolled out in several packages in 2008. You're talking about before then, um, what was actually historic then is like but a blip on the radar now. We've gotten so crazy with it, but um, QE. Eight. Let's just take a look, see if we can find it. So they had four rounds of QE. I'm just trying to figure out how much QE. And this was a big deal back then. This was a huge deal. You're talking about 175 billion drop in the bucket today. Just to put it in perspective, in 2020, in May of 2020, M2 went up by, I think, around $3 trillion, something like this, in a single month. Okay? Got people really care about their election years, right? They don't, never want to have to. That's the problem with politics is that it gets driven by these election cycles. I mean, back then, so, so this was spread out. This was spread out over a couple of years. You had a total thing of uh, 1.25 trillion. So what the government did, remember these mortgage-backed securities, what are they? They're, they're securities that give holders the right on income payments, right? Well, guess what? All these, all these foreclosures and everything made this security not worth as much, right? You had some, some issues there. And all these banks were holding it, and, and you know, all, all, there's all these uh, investment banks and other types of. It, it got it got fairly complicated as far as like how those were being held and traded. Which I'm not going to go into full detail. You can look into um, the derivatives if you want to look into it. But they made like securities based on securities, based on it just became like this chain of securitization um, that caused some instabilities. Um, but basically what the government did, what QE is, let me define it. Cause I said they did QE. QE is instead of going through traditional monetary policy means it means the government prints off money and then goes, Hey, you got some junk stuff. I'll buy it from it. I'll buy it. And they started buying up all these mortgage backed securities. Well, it seems like a, Seems like a decent thing, right? They can buy up mortgage-backed securities. They can, in that, in that kind of a way, they can, they can push monetary policy, they can make money more loose and seemingly have a tool to fight off uh, recessions by stimulating the economy still, by pumping cash into it, uh, by buying sometimes junk assets. In some ways, the one, one, of, the, one of the arguments um, that you have is that uh, you know you avoid you avoid massive fire sales 
and and I think I, I think I said you all know what I mean by fire sale. Yeah, it's like you, you get it's like you get forced into foreclosure. You got to put it up you, price of whatever you get. You, you it's going to sell for a deal, which means that it's driving the asset prices lower, which deepens the whole problem. Um, so you got the government starting its QE, getting its fingers nice and uh, wet in, in, in getting used to this new type of, this new wave of monetary policy. They're actually, the, the government's buying bonds, uh, mortgage-backed securities, and more recently, it, it's, it's actually gotten into stocks, corporate stocks, corporate bonds. Why do you think the stock market is probably doing so dang well when the whole economy is doing crap? Well, you throw trillions of dollars into something, it's going to do well. Right? Again, I encourage you to look at fundamentals like PE ratios, which you see got out of whack. You know, we've got an issue there. That's why I say at the end of the lecture, you might understand. I don't know that stocks are going to probably be something that's going to be taken off like they have in the past. Even though the economy right now is, is recovering and swinging back. We're swinging back into a, a growth phase but that's not going to get reflected because we had asset, you know, we had an overinflated stocks. We had a, we had a contracting economy and stock markets going up. Makes no sense unless you realize that hey, we're pumping a bunch of cash into the stock market. Okay, now it makes sense. Now when we stop pumping cash into it because they got to stop pumping cash and they can't keep doing this forever. We'll be in serious trouble. We'll talk about that in the next section about fiscal policy, about the trouble you get into with this. But um, you know, clearly, it's it's probably going to slow down. We'll be lucky if it doesn't dive at some point. If we can avoid that, we'll we'll be, we'll be good. Um, so actually, the uh, I would say um, I would say that that, 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 that so. If they can't affect interest rates directly through traditional monetary policy, they actually uh, they actually can. So, so getting involved in the bond markets, they can also drive uh, interest rates even lower. Because remember, the interest rate is zero, but then there's other rates out there being charged. Right now, the inflation is so high, inflation finally is catching back up. But before. This, before we started this class, inflation was just starting to hit the news lines. Okay, so when you rewind it back a little bit, you know, the people were talking about it, but it really started becoming a, hey, we got an issue. We have a real issue recently. Um, but before the, uh, before this was happening, the, uh, you know, the government can also uh, be buying and selling bonds. And, and I don't think I mentioned that. I'm a little tired. That's another important part of, that's actually one of the primary ways of monetary policy that I need to talk about, okay? So this is one of the primary things we all need to get is how does, how does monetary policy affect it with the buying and selling of bonds? How does that work? I'm gonna issue a bond. So I'm the government, let's, let's just run through it. A bond. Government bond, treasury bill. I'm going to issue these in the marketplace. Now, how do I do that? I have to have I have to, I have to go through what's called uh, open market operations. You know, that's a that's a term. Open market operations meaning I got to get these things to market. I got to get them on the exchanges. I got to push them out there into the world. So they do this through certain dealer channels and that kind of thing. You can look into it. But the idea, the, the basic idea I want to get through to everybody, we need to know here right now, is how does the flow of money work when they when the government sells bonds? Does the money does the money supply increase or decrease? Okay, Let's, do you want do I do it like as a as a? We'll do this as an example in in, in class. How's that? Okay, I hope who's got cash in. You got five bucks? Anybody else have cash in here? Okay, so pull up the cash. Let's throw it on the table. Hold it. You can stick it in an envelope, my name on it later, but we'll, uh, 
Hold the cash, stick it on the table. Okay, okay, so here we go. I'll, I'll give it a, a bond is an IOU, right? I owe you some money in the future. Got $5, I'll, I'll say I owe you $5 and 20 cents in the future, 20 cents being the interest I'll pay on, okay? So there's five dollars. This is the, this this is this class. We'll think of like the, the country, the USA, and there's a five dollar monetary bank. You've got five dollars in cash flow left. Okay. Now I go and I say, okay, who wants to buy bonds? Bonds for sale. You can buy some so, yeah, you buy some bonds. Okay. Okay. There's your bonds. Thank you very much. This is the bank, and what happened to the money supply? Supply of money. The supply of money, you're the economist. Went away, right? Will it come back? Will it come back? Yes, I'll give you $5 back. You see? So selling bonds pulls money out. Now, on the government, I can also, so selling money, selling bonds pulls money out and it's contractionary monetary policy, right? Now, you get the, you get the idea. Now I'm the government and I go to the market and, and there's, now there's zero dollars in the economy, okay? I don't know if you got a couple in your pocket or, you just didn't trust me to take it out, did you? That's okay. I'm not, I'm just <laughs> All right, so now, now look at the flip side. Now the government goes to open markets and they go buy bonds. And they say, okay, you're selling bonds. I'll buy some bonds for you. The government buys bonds. They put money back in. You see? I'm so tired. I didn't say that. Those are the, that that's one of the, that's the main policy vehicle for either doing expansionary or contractionary policy. So what you need to know is, you know, what, what you need to know is if I give you an ASAD curve, now I should ask you, now, now, now imagine that there are, we have downward sloping money demand, just a regular old standard old situation there. And I say, okay, I'm gonna go, so, so I'm sorry. I give you this real economy. I say, how could, how could the government get us back to a long run equilibrium? Should they buy or sell bonds? Should they buy or sell bonds right here? Here's the, here, huh? Yeah, buy bonds. Buy bonds, push money supply out, drop the interest rates, Push through the different channels that drive money, that drive the aggregate demand curve back to a, a long run equilibrium. So when the government sells bonds, it increases Yeah. Exactly. And the key, and the, and the key thing about QE, it makes it so. So so. Let me just say this: buying and selling uh, T bills has always been a um, a major vehicle for. The government to pursue monetary policy. Okay. Now the difference with with with, with that typical traditional method in QE what makes it different is that now, hey, the government's going to think about buying just about anything. Not not anything, but they they open up the possibilities to include corporate bonds and stocks, to include mortgage-backed securities, all kinds of other things that are not just typically government bonds. You see. That's the difference in QE. Sometimes QE is referred to as a helicopter drop. You can imagine old Uncle Sam up there with his helicopter just like dumping bags of cash out into the economy. Watch people going, yeah, yeah, I want some cash. <laughs> helicopter drop. Uh, anyway. Um, so that's QE in a nutshell. Now, problem with QE and dumping money out there is obviously one of inflation. 
And do you remember, um, do you remember there was one equation I gave you? This is trying to put a lot of things together. We're tying stuff together here. A lot of equate, do you remember, um, do you remember this equation? M B is equal to what? P Y. This is the this is the market value of goods of a sold. You have the money supply times the velocity. It has to equal to the amount of stuff sold. Remember all that? There's ten dollars of stuff. So if you had two items sold at five dollars a piece, that's ten dollars of stuff sold, right? If that was what was sold in that economy, and you only had one dollar bill floating around, you had ten dollars of stuff sold. That means it flipped around. It had a velocity of ten times. It ran around. That, that $1 bill ran around the economy 10 times in order to create that. You see? Make sense? You have money times the velocity. The velocity is how many times is that money churning around in the economy? Has to be equal to the market value of stuff sold, just that accounting de definition. See? And so looking back at that equation, I look at just this and I go, okay, well, if we're, so say we're not really like GDPs, just fix that. And people are gonna go out there and, 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 and perform in the market just as they were. So let's just hold velocity fixed for a moment, okay? So just holding those two things fixed for a moment, then increases in money should be directly proportional to increases in prices. Double your money, double your price. Now, again, putting it into a realistic perspective, velocity does change and output does change and that becomes more complicated. But just to give you a, map, a simple mapping of money supply and prices with this equation, you can think about that, okay? I mean, there's a, there's a kind of a story going on there. Hopefully, well, I think we'll have to return to that maybe. Are we just about wrapped up? I think so. So I think we actually covered quite a lot here. We got the whole, we, we wrapped up a, a nice history of the US in the 70s. We talked about how that, that interest rates rising caused a reorganization of our banking sector, mainly to the SNL crisis, leading to the securitization of mortgages, eventually causing what's called, uh, so, so there was uh, this, there was actually, I didn't, I didn't term, make the term, but by securitizing mortgages created moral hazard for the banks. Moral hazard meaning that they were not, they were not paying for the risk that they were extending. They're, they're, ext they're, they're giving credit but not, but not taking the, the credit risk. And on top of that, there were other risks associated that they were also not taking into account, mainly the risk of the whole system crashing down because of that. So if I go under, that's risk to me, right? But also if I go under and that causes asset prices to fall and causes you to go under, I'm not gonna take your costs into account either. So there's those kind of what you call externalities. There's a whole sort of dilemma that happened in lending, 2008 crisis, the falling interest rates all the way down to zero and the emergence of QE. And, that, and the tie of QE to inflation, which is why when I, when I looked and I saw our M2 increase by trillions of dollars in 2020, in an unhistorical way. I think I showed you all M2, did I not? I showed you M2 and it has a cliff. In a single month, you never see like that ever in history. In a single month, you got a cliff, un unprecedented increase in money supply. It has to eventually lead to inflation. Think about it, as the, as the economy recovers, as things, as the velocity sort of returns, as, as people go back to buying stuff, has to lead to inflation because output growth. So, so, so remember, if, if the money grows the same as output, then there's not going to be a change in prices. 
You see that too. But the money supply jumped by such a big amount, there's no way for us to make that up by, by growing the economy. Do y'all see that as well? If your money growth grows at the same rate as your output, then actually you're, it's, it's not gonna be inflationary. Okay, but when you see that cliff jump up, you go, there's no way our economy is gonna grow like that to, to match that, that has to be inflationary. Welcome to election years, you know, people, they jump off there and, and, and knowing, in fact, that, that that is actually stimulating to an economy to jump your money supply and knowing also that it, it takes a long time for it to filter through into where we're at now. I mean, how many years has it been now? A couple of years and now we're starting to see it big time. Why? Because remember, excess reserves, pilot, all that money, sits, it, it goes out there. A lot of it sits in banks. Yeah, banks can go do things like buy stocks, they buy in stocks and all kinds of things like this, but there's also a good chunk that was just sitting there in banks not getting put out into lending. And so with the return of lending, as, as, we, as, we continue, as banks continue to lend, as those excess reserves continue to fall, you know, we're gonna have more inflation coming. And it's just, it's unavoidable at this point. I don't, you know, I don't see how, maybe, I don't see what they're going to do about it. I mean, at some point they're going to, that, that's why you see interest rates hike again. Interest rates have to come up. Is it a good time for interest rates to come up? Yeah, probably not right at the tail of, a, of we're just starting to get, you know, come back and now you're going to start spiking us with high interest rates, but gee, what else are you going to do? Let inflation go triple digit? I mean, what are you going to do? Right? It has to be something. Inflation is the, the worry now. It's going to be the worry for a while. And there's other pools of inflation, other bubbles sitting there, thinking about big balloons full of water that also haven't popped. That could be sources of future inflation, and God forbid those ever pop, such as the foreign banks holding our US dollars in their vaults. I should be a little bit wary about, you know, those discussions of like, should Bitcoin take over? Guess what, folks? You really don't want to have the, you don't really don't want to have your U.S. dollar lose legitimacy. You don't. You're going to suffer tremendously in that kind of an event. Okay. So just be wary out there. And there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of foreign influences that would like to see that happen. Let me just tell you, I could go into that in some detail. I got I, I was in the policy discussions. You got, I don't know if you ever heard of BRICS, okay? But there's a, there's a whole block of, you got uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China operating in their own sort of act, they've got their own agreements with, with an ambition to destabilize the dollar, mainly driven by China. China's got gigantic global ambitions right now. Trump's of uh, ousting us in, in all the different ways that we have some advantage, including our dollars, okay? They, they'd like to see the renminbi be the currency. They'd like to actually digitize and have a digital sort of Bitcoin, and they actually do, they have, they have that. They'd like to push that out there and have all trade and everything else be denominated, oil, everything else be denominated in their Chinese renminbi Bitcoin, which I don't trust worth a day. Sure, there's gonna be some digital little marker tracking everything down. You can guarantee it. You go, you, you go visit the, the mainland there and, and anything, I mean, like companies actually just take the laptop and junk them when they come back. Cause you know, all the tracking stuff that you get on your device, they'll sniff, they'll sniff, they'll sniff the heck out of you. I don't trust it. Um, anyway, that's enough. Uh, monetary policy, well, I'll, I'll, I think you guys have an assignment posted, Wolf Den. And there, I'll make sure you get a reading and I'll try to also put up questions that are specific that will end their way on an exam. We need to have an exam scheduled soon. I'd like to give people some exam opportunities in case they missed an exam before or did poorly and just to prepare you for the final too. So I'll, I'll, I'll get all that going.
four instead of five.